The listening part of this occupational English test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Greg Matthews. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, doctor, he is Mr. Greg Matthews, my husband. Actually, he fell down yesterday morning when he was trying to put his boots on top of the staircase. He fell down 20 steps and he has lost his consciousness. He was evaluated by a local clinic and was amnestic at the time of examination. A HCT scan was taken and thereafter they referred to your hospital. Well, what's his age? 72, doctor. Does he drink or smoke? No, doctor. May I know his past medical history? Well, he had atrial fibrillation, right hemisphere stroke last year, with associated left hemiparesis and amaurosis fugax. This was followed by a right coronary artery for 98% stenosis. However, the stroke symptoms and signs were resolved. Degenerative joint disease total replacement of right knee two years ago, venous stasis with no history of deep vein thrombosis. What medications is he taking? Lasix, 40 milligrams once in a day. Zantac, 150 milligrams once in a day. Lenoxin, 0.125 milligrams once daily. Capotin, 2.5 milligrams twice a day. Salsalate, 750 milligrams thrice a day. ASA, 325 milligrams once in a day. Ginsana, 100 milligrams twice a day. Is he allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. May I know his family history of illness? Well, his father expired of a myocardial infarction at 70, and his mother died of complications of a dental procedure. Well, his physical examination reports show blood pressure 157 over 86. Heart rate and irregular respiratory rate, 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Reflexes are symmetric. Plantar responses were flexor, bilaterally. His cardiovascular regular rate and rhythm without murmur. H-E-E-N-T shows abrasion over the right forehead. Extremity, distal right leg edema and erythema just above the ankle. Well, I have reviewed his previous HCT scan, which reveals a left parietal epidural hematoma. Right lower extremity revealed a fracture of the right lateral malleolus for which he was casted. I am ordering a repeat HCT scan to see if there is any change in the epidural hematoma. Upon seeing the reports, I shall suggest further treatments. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. James Williams. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, he's my father, and he had a septic shock. And when we consulted locally, the diagnosis revealed elevated cardiac enzyme profile. He had some workup done from cardiac standpoint, which has been negative so far. Okay. Does he have any previous history of chest pain or shortness of breath? No, doctor. What is his name and age? His name is James Williams, and he's 58 years old, doctor. Does he have any history of hypertension or diabetes mellitus? No, doctor. Does he smoke or drink? No, doctor. May I know his past medical history? Well, he had pulmonary fibrosis, and he is on prednisone. Oxygen-dependent cellulitis, status post-foot surgery with infection, recuperating from the same. Respiratory acidosis, septicemia, and septic shock. Presently on mechanical ventilation. No prior cardiac history. Elevated cardiac enzyme profile. He had any surgery earlier? Yes, he had foot surgery. Okay. What medicines he is taking now? Vitamin supplementation, prednisone. Cyclobenzaprine, Losertan, 50 mg daily, Nifedipine, 90 mg daily, Lasix, potassium supplementation. Is he allergic to any medicine? Yes, he's allergic to sulfa. Well, his physical examination reports show pulse rate of 94, blood pressure of 98 over 57, respiratory rate as normal, air entry bilaterally clear, rails are scattered, Point of maximal impulse displaced, S1, S2, regular. Systolic murmur, grade 2 of 6. There are chronic skin changes, markings in the lower extremities. Pulses found palpable. His laboratory reports show echocardiogram is normal. Sinus rhythm with wide complex. White blood count of 20,000, hemoglobin 10, and hematocrit 33. Platelets of 163, international normalized ratio 1.36, BUN of 158, creatinine 8.7, potassium 7.3 of bicarbonate is 11, cardiac enzyme profile troponin 0.05, total creatine kinase 312, myoglobin 1423. Chest x-ray, no acute changes. He has pulmonary fibrosis and is on prednisone. Oxygen dependent with respiratory acidosis. Septicemia, septic shock secondary to cellulitis of the leg. Acute renal shutdown. Elevated cardiac enzyme profile without prior cardiac history, possibly due to sepsis and also acute renal failure. I am ordering an echocardiogram to assess left ventricle function to rule out any cardiac valvular involvement. He needs aggressive medical management, including dialysis. From a cardiac standpoint, conservative treatment at this juncture. His cardiac enzyme profile could be elevated secondary to sepsis and also underlying renal failure. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about spastic cerebral palsy and its classifications. Hello, doctor. What is spastic cerebral palsy and how is it classified? Well, spastic cerebral palsy is the common type of cerebral palsy that also accompanies nearly a third of other types of cerebral palsy. The damage is in the corticospinal tract or the motor cortex. This part affects the areas that receive gamma aminobutyric acid that is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, 
Spastic cerebral palsy is further divided into types according to the areas of the body that it affects. In spastic diplegia, the lower limbs are affected with little to no upper body spasticity. Most people with spastic diplegia are fully ambulatory and have a scissors gait. They may also have other problems like hip problems, dislocations, crossed eyes, or strabismus. In spastic hemiplegia, one side of the body is affected, which occurs when injury occurs to muscle nerves controlled by the left side of the brain, will cause a right body deficit, and when injury occurs to muscle nerves controlled by the right side of brain, will cause a left body deficit, vice versa. In spastic tetraplegia, all four limbs affected equally. These patients are least likely to be able to walk because their muscles are too tight, and they may also develop an uncontrollable shaking that affects the limbs on one side of the body that impairs normal movement. Question 26. You hear a discussion about different dose rates of brachiotherapy. Hello, doctor. What are different dose rates of brachytherapy? Well, brachytherapy is a form of localized radiation therapy involving the direct placement of radioactive material close to or inside a tumor. Brachytherapy varies by dose, mode of delivery, and the location of the cancer. High dose rate brachytherapy is given over periods of 10 to 20 minutes. The radiation dose is delivered as a short burst using a remote after loading machine. Low-dose rate brachytherapy is administered at a continuous rate in sessions that can last up to 50 hours. In the pulsed dose rate brachytherapy, the radiation is usually delivered once every hour rather than continuously. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about bariatric surgery. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of bariatric surgery? Well, there are four different types of surgeries offered to patients. The main principle of adjustable gastric banding is to decrease food intake with the use of a small bracelet-like band placed around the top of the stomach. The band restricts the size of the opening from the throat to the stomach, limiting the amount of food a patient can ingest. The size of the opening can be modified using a balloon inside the band that can be inflated or deflated with saline solution according to the needs of the patient. Biliopancreatic diversion with a duodenal switch, also known as the duodenal switch, is a three-stage procedure that involves the removal of a large part of the stomach, which makes the patient feel full after eating only a small meal, followed by rerouting of the small intestines to prevent food absorption. The third step involves changing how bile and other digestive juices affect the process of digesting and absorbing calories. Roux-en-Y gastric bypass method is also used to decrease food intake and involves creating a small pouch. The food bypasses the rest of the stomach and reaches the small intestine, where it is absorbed to a much lesser degree than if it had passed through the stomach, duodenum, and upper intestine. Vertical sleeve gastrectomy procedure involves removal of most of the stomach, which not only restricts food intake and absorption, but lowers the levels of the hormone ghrelin that is responsible for appetite. Question 28. You hear a discussion about oral lichen planus lesions. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of oral lichen planus lesions? Well, oral lichen planus lesions may belong to one of the following six types. Reticular is the common and usually asymptomatic that presents with a fine network of white lines called Wickham's striae, which are symmetrical and found on both sides of the mouth, usually over the buccal mucous membrane. 
Erosive consists of irregular painful ulcers covered by a yellowish pseudomembrane of fibrin with the white striae all around the lesions. Atrophic is usually found as an ulcer covered by fibrinous exudate on an erythematous background. Bolus is the rarest type that is characterized by small or large vesicles or bully, which break open leaving a painful ulcer. Papular is an uncommon type, consisting of tiny raised white spots with the characteristic white striae at the periphery. The plaque lesions appear as smooth to slightly roughened whitish patches, rather like leukoplakia, found over the tongue and the inside of the cheeks. Question 29. You hear a lecture about the autoimmune diseases that affect the blood and blood vessels. What are the autoimmune diseases that affect the blood and blood vessels? Well, polyarteritis nodosa is a severe autoimmune disease affecting the small and medium-sized arteries that become inflamed and damaged. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura causes damage to the blood platelets that are essential to formation of blood clots. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome leading to damage to blood vessels. Hemolytic anemia is caused when the immunological cells damage the blood cells. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of biosensing elements. Hello, doctor. What are biosensing elements? Well, an enzyme is a protein that has a high selectivity for a particular substrate, which it binds to, bringing about a catalytic change. Enzymes are commercially available in highly purified states and are therefore useful in the mass production of enzyme sensors. Enzymes can be fixed onto the surface of a transducer through absorption, covalent attachment, and entrapment in a gel or an electrochemically generated polymer. Antibodies, or immunosensors, are produced by B lymphocytes in response to antigenic stimuli such as foreign invaders or microbes. When used as biosensors and immunoassays, antibodies are immobilized on the surface of a transducer through covalent attachment by conjugation of amino, carboxyl, aldehyde, or sulfhydryl groups. Antibodies are sensitive to changes in potential hydrogen, ionic strength, chemical inhibitors, and temperature. Immune sensors usually employ optical, fluorescence, or acoustic transducers. Microorganisms or microbes may be used to detect the consumption of oxygen or carbon dioxide in an environment using electrochemical techniques. Microbiosensors have the advantage of being cheaper than enzymes or antibodies and are more stable. However, they may be less selective than enzymes or antibodies. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which best fits according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at extract one. Extract one, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors about bone marrow transplant procedures. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello, doctor. Can you kindly explain bone marrow transplant procedures? Well, bone marrow consists of precursor or predecessor immature cells called stem cells. These are primitive cells that are capable of producing all types of cells. Blood cells, like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets start out from young cells called hematopoietic stem cells. Stem cells mostly live in the bone marrow where they divide and make new blood cells. These cells mature into adult cells and then leave the marrow into the bloodstream. A small amount of stem cells also get into the bloodstream, which are called peripheral blood stem cells. When the bone marrow has been destroyed by disease, chemotherapy, or radiation, the stem cells may be transplanted and restored. Depending on the source of the stem cells, this procedure may be called either bone marrow transplant or peripheral blood stem cell transplant or cord blood transplant. These three types are called hematopoietic stem cell transplant. There are three possible sources of stem cells to use for transplants, which includes bone marrow, the bloodstream, or peripheral blood, umbilical cord blood from newborns. The first successful bone marrow transplant was done in 1968. After nearly two decades, stem cells taken from peripheral blood were transplanted with success. More recently, doctors have started using cord blood from the placenta and umbilical cords of newborn babies as another source of stem cells. Today, nearly 50,000 new transplants are done each year. Well, doctor, when is a bone marrow transplant required? Stem cell transplants are used to replace bone marrow that's been destroyed by diseases such as leukemia, aplastic anemia, certain inherited blood, exposure to cancer chemotherapy, cancer radiation therapy, some diseases of the immune system. In these conditions, the stem cells become incapable to make adequate blood cells. Therefore, a stem cell transplant may help correct these problems. In certain types of cancers, such as certain leukemias, multiple myeloma, and some lymphomas, a stem cell transplant can be an essential part of treatment. For these patients, high doses of chemotherapy or radiation therapy, although a good option, the procedure causes bone marrow suppression. Therefore, once high doses are used, a stem cell transplant is made to replenish the suppressed marrow. Different types of bone marrow transplant include autologous transplant, cells come from the patient's own bone marrow, allogeneic transplant, the cells come from a matched related or unrelated donor, syngeneic transplant, the cells are derived from an identical twin. Autologous stem cell transplant. In this type, the patient's own bone marrow cells are taken prior to the anti-cancer procedure, and these stem cells are harvested from either bone marrow or blood and then frozen. The advantage is that the patients get their own blood cells, and thus there is a decreased risk of the immune system not recognizing the cells and rejecting them, or mounting an attack on them, which is called graft rejection, and rejection makes allogeneic transplants difficult. The disadvantage of this process is the risk of the originally taken stem cells carrying cancer cells that are reintroduced in the body. This may bring the cancer back. Normally, autologous stem cell transplant is mainly used to treat certain leukemias with lymphomas and multiple myeloma. At times, it is also used for other types of cancers, especially in children. In a tandem transplant, a patient gets two courses of high-dose chemo, each followed by a transplant of their own stem cells. All of the stem cells needed are collected before the first high-dose chemo treatment, and half of them are used for each procedure. Allogeneic stem cell transplant. In this type, the stem cells do not come from the patient, but from a donor whose tissue type is matched with the patient. Usually, the donor is a family member or sibling of the patient. The donor may be sought from a national registry as well. This may be called a matched, unrelated donor transplant. Cord blood transplant is another procedure where blood is taken from the placenta and umbilical cord of newborns. This blood has a high number of stem cells, but the number of stem cells in a unit of cord blood is often too low for large adults, so this source of stem cells has so far been used more in children. The advantage of allogenic transplant is that the donor stem cells make their own immune cells, which may help destroy any cancer cells in the patient. The disadvantage is the risk of graft rejection that may require lifelong use of immunity-suppressing agents. Allogeneic transplant is most often used to treat certain types of leukemia, lymphomas, and other bone marrow disorders such as myelodysplasia. A number of factors play a role in how the immune system knows the difference between self and non-self. The most important factor that is used in allogenic transplants is called human leukocyte antigen system. Human leukocyte antigens are proteins found on the surface of most cells. Each person has a number of pairs of human leukocyte antigens. 
They inherit one of each of these antigens from each of their parents. Physicians try to match these antigens when finding a donor for patient person getting a stem cell transplant. Syngeneic stem cell transplant is possible only between identical twins or triplets with similar genetic makeup. An advantage of syngeneic stem cell transplant is that graft versus host disease will not be a problem. There are no cancer cells in the transplant. Now, look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on bone cancer. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Can you explain what is bone cancer? Well, bone cancer or sarcoma may be of two types. Primary bone cancer that begins in the bone and secondary bone cancer that originates elsewhere in the body, such as lungs, breast, liver, and metastasizes to the bone. The bone cancer usually begins with bone pain that usually gets worse over time and may wake the affected person from sleep. There may be bone fractures with a less severe impact or trauma swelling and tenderness over the affected area as well. Joint movement may become difficult if the joints are affected. Moreover, there may be weakness, weight loss, fever, and other general symptoms. The risk factors for bone cancer include exposure to radiation in the past, having Paget's disease of the bone that affects the growth cycle of the bone cells. Only around 1% of patients with Paget's disease may develop bone cancer. There is no evidence that an injury to the bone causes any cancer. However, there may be a link to rare genetic conditions such as Lee-Fermini syndrome. Bone is composed of cells that grow and form collagen fibers, as well as minerals like calcium that give it sturdiness. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts are the two main types of cells within the hard bone tissue that mold the bone. Osteoblasts form the bone by laying down bone material, while osteoclasts dissolve the particles of bone and cause resorption. These cells are active throughout life and work in tandem to balance to keep the bone constantly growing and dissolving. There is a slow but constant turnover of bone. Another type of cell is chondrocytes that make cartilage. These make the hard tissues that cover the ends of bones and joints. In the middle of some larger bones is the soft bone marrow that is the place where blood cells are manufactured. Although bone cancers are very rare, there are four major types of bone cancer of primary origin. These include osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, spindle cell sarcoma, and chondrosarcoma. Osteosarcoma or osteogenic sarcoma is the most common type of primary bone cancer that starts in the bones. The cancer cells in these tumors look like early forms of bone cells that normally help make new bone tissue, but the bone tissue in osteosarcoma is not as strong as that of normal bones. This type of bone cancer is seen commonly in children and young adults between ages of 5 and 20. 
Among young people, osteosarcoma is the third most common cancer after leukemia and brain tumors. Osteosarcoma affects larger bones, such as the thigh bone, called femur, or the shin bone, called tibia. Ewing sarcoma is a very rare type of cancerous tumor that grows in our bones or the soft tissue around the bones, such as cartilage or the nerves. It usually affects people from the ages of 10 to 20 and has a high rate of being cured. Spindle cell sarcoma most commonly form in the adults over 40 years. It is a type of connective tissue tumor and begins in layers of connective tissue, such as that under the skin, between muscles, and surrounding organs. Chondrosarcoma commonly affects the sites such as pelvis, thigh bone, upper arm bone, shoulder blade, called scapula, and the ribs. Bone cancer treatment includes therapy with medication or chemotherapy to reduce the size of the tumor and then follow up with surgery to remove the affected area of the bone. Earlier bone cancer surgery involved removal of the limb altogether, called amputation. Nowadays, the affected part of the bone may be removed and replaced with metal implants, which is called limb-sparing surgery. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. That is the end of this listening test.